Our next group of speakers will focus on health, enriching human life and society. Human health is impacted by our environment, the bacteria that co-inhabit our bodies, the proteins that our cells produce, our metabolism, and our genomes. Here at UC San Diego, advances in discipline-specific knowledge and novel technological capabilities provide new opportunities for multidisciplinary and translational work with the potential to keep people healthy and transform the delivery of healthcare. Making good on that potential will require the processing of huge amounts of data, for which the campus is well positioned. Key organizing frameworks that support our work in this area include the Institute for Engineering and Medicine, for example, promotes collaborations between faculty in the health sciences and engineering to develop creative new technologies to improve health and clinical care. The Qualcomm Institute provides a meeting ground for engineering, information, and communication technologies, the digital arts, and applications to societal problem solving, and for mapping human and microbial genomics, and for defining the human health and basic biology in terms of integrated omics, genomics, metabomics, proteomics, etc. The San Diego Supercomputer Center exemplifies the tradition of developing the technological infrastructure and data analytic software to enable massive data sets to be applied to complex phenomena. UC San Diego is also a leader in the understanding, prevention, and treatment of many diseases, including cardiovascular, neurological diseases, and cancer. Our next group of speakers will describe some of the ways in which UC San Diego is leading the path to better health through utilization of big data across disciplines. Dr. Rizal Kurzak from the Moore's Cancer Center will demonstrate the potential promises and challenges of personalized cancer medicine. Roselle Kurzrock received her medical degree from the University of Toronto. She is best known for successfully creating and chairing the largest phase one clinical trials department in the world while at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Her unique approach emphasized a personalized strategy to optimize cancer treatment by using cutting edge molecular profiling technologies to match patients with novel targeted therapies. Dr. Kurzrock has served as a principal investigator on more than 90 clinical trials and has overseen more than 300 trials, mainly using novel targeted mole molecules, several of which have gone on to Food and Drug Administration approval. Tonight, she'll share how genomics and immunotherapy are increasing survival in a remarkable way and seeing responses in patients who were previously considered untreatable. Please welcome Dr. Rizal Kurzrock. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me speak here and uh, really an incredible group of speakers. I guess I'll walk around like other people did um, uh, before me, and uh, so it's a hard act to follow. But um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the cancer field. And um, I think uh, just about everybody gets touched by cancer so sooner or later. Um, one in every three people develop uh, are diagnosed with cancer and uh, there's really hardly anybody that hasn't had somebody in their family diagnosed or uh, they themselves have been diagnosed with cancer and unfortunately especially when uh, cancer becomes metastatic um, it really becomes difficult to treat and most patients uh, do die of it um, but I think uh, we're really beginning to understand cancer much better and um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, change that in the near future. Um, so um, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is this idea of personalizing uh, therapy and actually matching patients with uh, target-based agents. Uh, so what are target-based agents? Um, these are drugs that have been developed to target specific abnormalities that drive cancer cells um, but are not found in normal cells or expressed at a much lower level in normal cells. And uh, that means that while, they can kill, while these agents can kill the cancer cells, uh, they don't do a lot of damage to the normal cells. So there's a much bigger differential than with 
uh, classic chemotherapy. Now, one thing um, I hear very frequently is that we need new drugs to treat cancer. And of course, that's a really great idea. We always need new drugs to treat cancer. But there's actually a very fundamental problem in the way we classify cancer. And unless we overcome that problem, it really doesn't matter how many new drugs uh, we uh, develop. So I'm going to give you a really simple example but um, I hope it'll illustrate the thinking. So I think everybody here would understand that insulin is a really great drug, a revolutionary drug, but it wouldn't be a revolutionary drug um, if we used it to treat pneumonia. Actually, it would be a pretty lousy drug. And we would conclude if we used insulin to treat pneumonia, not only that insulin is not a very good drug, but that uh, pneumonia is a really difficult disease to treat. And I know that sounds simplistic, but essentially that's probably what we've done in cancer for most of my career. We may have really good drugs, but we have no idea to which patients to give them. And so we sort of give them randomly to patients, and a few respond here and there, but that doesn't work out very well. But I think we have a lot more knowledge now, and we have the tools to really change that. And that's really what I want to talk about. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background uh, about myself and uh, how I came to think about this. Um, I worked at MD Anderson for a long period of time, and I was charged with building a new tr uh, department, uh, which was a department of phase one clinical trials, which are those drugs that have moved for the first time from animals to humans. And there's been now a wealth of drugs that are targeted against specific signals known to be abnormal in cancer that have now moved into the clinic, into patients. And uh, what we started doing around the end of 2007 is applying some of the new genomic molecular profiling techniques um, to understand the genomic abnormalities in patients and to match them with drugs. Now, as you might imagine, uh, the uh, technology available, the tools available in the end of 2007 when we started doing this was pretty primitive compared to what we have available today. But nevertheless, by doing a few thousand patients, we learned a lot. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we learned. And I think one of the main take home messages um, that I would like to um, impart is that uh, the future is here. Um, a lot of what I want to talk about transforming cancer treatment is not um, something that will happen in five or ten years from now, but it's actually something that we're doing right now. And uh, that doesn't mean that we still don't have more to learn. Of course we do. But it's not all about the future anymore. It's about the now. Um, so why are cancers so difficult to treat? Why has it been really so tough? Uh, so this is, about, this is a pie chart about lung cancer. We used to think lung cancer was one disease. Uh, but what we now know is that actually lung cancer is made up of multiple different diseases. And each subset is defined by a different genomic abnormality. And therefore, what we used to think is, can we find this, why do we keep on finding drugs that work in 5% of lung cancer? You know, we really need a better drug that's going to work in 90%. But now we understand that that may be biologically impossible because, in fact, um, the reason a drug works in 5% is because that 5% defines a subgroup of patients that are, um, uh, that in which the lung cancer is caused by a specific abnormality. Uh, so the idea more and more is now to uh, divide and conquer. We have to divide the diseases up based on their molecular abnormalities in order to con uh, uh, in order to contact them. And we have to understand that each patient is different and that specific targeted agents will work only in, when given to the right patient who has the sensitizing abnormality. Um, so we had created a protocol that I want to talk to you about, and I think it'll illustrate a little bit about where this is going. It was called PREDICT, or Profile-Related Evidence Determining Individualized Cancer Therapy. And we began to look at cancer in what we called histology-independent approach. So histology-independent means um, we weren't looking at it in the classic way. Usually you diagnose cancer as um, if it comes from the breast, it's a breast cancer. If it comes from the colon, it's a colon cancer. We didn't 
really worry about where it came from. We wanted to know the underlying molecular abnormality that was driving the cancer regardless of where it came from, and then to match patients uh, with the appropriate drugs. Uh, the patients that came to us um, in this setting, I want to mention, uh, they were end-stage cancer patients. By definition, because they were going on early experimental therapy, each patient had already been told that there was nothing more that can be done for them, and they had failed to uh, respond to usually about four or five different therapies in the metastatic setting. So these are really pretty tough patients. And we began to look at the mutations, and I use PIK3CA as an example. It's a common mutation and um, it drives cancers. Uh, but there's a few points I want to make from this slide. First of all, it was found in about 10% of 1,000 patients with advanced cancer. But I think what you can see is it was found in a subset of multiple different cancers. And this, um, you know, endometrial cancer, 29%, breast cancer is 24%. And really, if you look at almost any cancer, you can find this abnormality. And more importantly, the aberration didn't segregate by organ of origin. So this means that our classic um, way of classifying cancers wasn't really working out, because if we're going to give a drug that um, suppresses the PIK3CA, we can't choose patients by whether they have breast or colon cancer. We have to choose them by whether or not they have the abnormality. And so this is what happened when we started treating patients in this way. Remember, these are end-stage patients. This is a waterfall plot and shows if the patient is progressing or not. Anything below the horizontal line is a response. Anything above is um, progression. And this is what happens um, when you do this the normal way, where you diagnose cancer, whether they're breast or colon, but without molecular matching. You get about 5% of patients responding. So it's not very high. But when we started treating patients, by matching them at a molecular level, the response rates went up to 27%. Certainly not what we'd like it to be, but about five times higher than the baseline response rates. And more importantly, we really began to see some very interesting things, uh, which suggested that genomics was a disruptive technology and that we really have to begin to think differently about um, the way we do clinical trials and the way we do practice. So this is a series of paper, patients on which we do uh, genomic testing, and we actually did 75. These are breast cancer patients. And these are the genomic abnormalities that you see in these patients, but the main thing um, that I want to point out is that there's no two that are the same. Some patients have things in common, but even when they have something in common, the rest of their genomic portfolio is different. And yet, the way we treat patients and the way we do clinical research is to try and find things in common between patients and treat them in the same way. But this tells us that that's not going to work because each patient is different. And actually, we expect it's going to get even more complicated because we've only been doing genomics, and yet there's so much more to do. There's the RNA, there's protein, there's so much more. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg. So this individuality is going to become even more pronounced. Um, so a little bit what we're, about what we're doing at Moore's Cancer Center uh, to make this real for patients. Uh, we've developed a center for personalized cancer therapy. It has multiple different components, um, and it tries to take advantage of some of the real strengths uh, in the area, the uh, 600 uh, biotech startups, the supercomputer center, um, the collaborations with all the great science, Salk, Sanford Burnham, Scripps, UCSD and uh, developing um, new clinical trials. And then um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, we've developed a molecular tumor board. So this really makes it uh, real for patients. So we have now um, uh, sequenced about 1,000 patients um, with clinical grade sequencing. This is sequencing that can actually be used to make decisions on patients. And we bring together our physicians, our radiologists, our surgeons, but also our bioinformatics specialists, people from the supercomputer center, our scientists, and we try to make decisions um, on these patients, usually they're end stage patients, where we use the molecular profiling to specifically make a decision of targeted and tailored treatment recommendations for these patients. Um, I've talked about the tumor 
but we're really discovering that uh, hereditary predispositions are also going to be very important and again, I think we've just begun to touch the tip of the iceberg here. So what the patient's genomics, not just the tumor genomics, may tell us their uh, immunity, uh, their immune response, will they have side effects from the drug, and so forth. And um, you know, so the question is, does this uh, robust, this is real actually, 100-year-old woman, um, was this really good luck that um, she smokes like a chimney and is in really good health? Or was this genomically predetermined? And I really believe it's genomically predetermined. And in the same way, we may be able to determine if people will have side effects from a drug um, or if they'll have an immune response as well. And then, um, you know, I'd like to finish off by uh, saying that this is really not just about cancer. Um, I believe that cancer is in the forefront because it's been such a horrible disease and such an urgent problem. Uh, but I want to give you this example. This is really going to touch all of medicine. So you see this woman, and she has bladder cancer, and her bladder cancer is due to a mutation in a gene called FGFR3 uh, that developed in her bladder. And we have drugs now that can specifically impact and inhibit that uh, gene function. But what is really fascinating to me is what you see on the other side is uh, people with achondroplastic dwarfism. And they have the exact same mutation, but they were born with it. And so is it possible that the drugs that we're now using in cancer could affect um, some of these children? This is not an isolated incident. This is really, we are finding out in cancer all sorts of things that are meaningful outside the cancer field. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, San Diego's incredibly beautiful.